My name is Thibaut. I'm an engineering lead at Angelist, and uh, I don't drink coffee. I drink Liquid Death exclusively. This is my go-to drink, so. Hello, and welcome to another MLOps Community Podcast. I am your host, Demetrios, and today I am joined by none other than Mr. Ryan Rousseau. How you doing, dude? Doing all right. It's been a, been a minute, but yeah, glad to be here. You graduated from guest to co-host, and now... You were such a good co-host the first time we had you on. I had to have you back. <laughs> and I am very happy that I did. We explored just about everything when it comes to using open AI models, building them into your product with Tibo in this conversation. Did you have any main takeaways that you want to share with us? I think they're similar to what you said, but I think a lot of it, you know, I'm an infrastructure person in general. Um, yeah, over engineering crap is my job. No, I, <laughs> I, I was, I'm always intrigued to hear how today, again, with the hype around these, uh, these LLM models, and especially as like a, as a service being provided by so many different companies, such as OpenAI, how people are building around them and how they're extracting value from them. Cause it's, I think, right. The value is more than just wrapping it up in a piece <laughs> of software. There's a lot that goes into it. I think that was interesting how Thibaut went through all that and talked about those challenges and the things that he had to do to make specifically relay his product for angel list kind of a viable solution and really bring value out of that yeah so he breaks down relay what it is they just released it today on the day of this recording which by the time this comes out will be like a month ago but i was fascinated with his dedication to figuring out if a feature is actually viable and if it's worth pursuing and not getting caught up in the over-engineering like you were saying. And so him going from zero to one on the two different use cases that he talked about, I thought were awesome to see. And every time we asked him all these things about, well, what about if, do you want to use a new model? Maybe you want to try different APIs like Anthropic or Cohere. He's like, yeah, but we've got so many different features that we want to Im- we want to create. Why would I waste my time trying to figure out a new model when I can spend my time creating new features with the model that I already know works quite well? And I mean, I, I we questioned him a bit, right? I challenged him a bit on the, the scale, right? Like, what is the upper limit? And there's definitely risk when you tie yourself to a third-party vendor. There's risk when you tie yourself to a managed cloud service as well, right? I loved hearing how he was mitigating those risks, how they thought through them. It wasn't just like, oh yeah, I didn't really think about that. It was like, no, we thought through this process. We thought about it beforehand. We made a deliberate decision to proceed the way we did. And I don't know, I, I appreciated that. Again, that's that like narrow focus on this is what we're trying to deliver. Here's the value we want to add. We're not worried about this limit right now but we'll get there maybe, you know, we'll worry about it when it's a little bit more pressing. And I I think it's brilliant that they're just sticking to their guns and trying to tackle the low hanging fruit before they add complexity to the scenario. And as he was saying, yeah, we're going to look at fine tuning or creating, potentially creating our own large language model and going after all of that. But first let's just tackle these use cases that we know we can use open AI for, and we know it brings a huge value add to the end user. So hats off to them for that. I think we should just go ahead and get right into the conversation. But before we do, I want to mention to everyone, it would be a huge help if you have not already hit follow or subscribe or like or rated this podcast means the world to us if you do. And also that one thing that would help us the most would be if you share this podcast with one friend so that we continue to spread the good word of the MLOps community. And without further ado, let's jump into the conversation. I'm seeing also... um, that you're a huge fan of Isaac. What brings that about? <laughs> Isaac Asimov, like uh, 
some of the best books I've read as a kid, actually really early on. And Uncle gave me Foundation. And I just devoured the series, like all the prequels, all the sequels. So yeah, really big fan. And I think his vision is still relevant today, especially as <laughs> we see all the advances in uh, AI, machine learning. Did you watch the series? Yep, on Apple TV. Yeah, Love what'd it. you think? You liked it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's different from the book, but honestly, like, you know, for me, like going back into this universe is just, just, uh, just amazing. It's like a, a dream come true. What captured your imagination the most? I think the portrayal of Cleon, like the, you know, the emperor and like, uh, like the, the way they render, like the three generations living together. I think that's <laughs> always like interesting, like really well done. Yeah. And so for those who don't know, maybe what, it, what is it that we are talking about right now? The foundation series, this was a book that was published in the eighties, right? Or was it even, it was... yeah, maybe if you're earlier than that, I think a little earlier, Please check. Actually, yeah. Yeah. Ask, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like some very sci-fi book but it it explores a lot of these existential questions and yeah asimov is uh, the one who created the three laws of robotics right that robots should uh like obey orders that uh, they should not harm the any human and uh you know what i should probably find them. <laughs> that was kind of the confusing part is that instantly it's not clear like the whole thing about these books that is so brilliant is how he explores the gray area. And that's right. And that's my, my biggest takeaway is that it's, yeah, you can have these three laws, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of room for interpretation and especially depending on the events and depending on how reality plays itself out, you can get yourself into sticky situations. That's right. It's also the question of like saving one person, you know, by I mean, maybe harming another one. Like what call should the robot make? And especially as it scaled to all of humanity, right? And that was the third law, right? You have robots got to protect its own existence so long as it doesn't violate the first two laws. right? Guess. That's correct. Well, awesome. I didn't think we were going to take that turn, but let's, <laughs> there we are. let's get into this, man. So you're working at AngelList right now. Y'all are doing some pretty wild stuff when it comes to AI and ML. It's probably worth just giving us a bit of background on on what the ML journey has been like and then how it's changed since the emergence of ChatGPT and all that fun stuff. Yeah, for sure. So um, I joined AngelList about like two years ago and uh, this was for me uh, a dream job. Like I Angel invested on the platform for a few years and uh, yeah, getting to work on my hobby was uh, uh, a lot of fun. And um, my background was working on uh, natural language processing at Amazon, basically parsing all customer feedback, right? So that we could package it for PMs throughout the company to, to use to improve their products or improve experiences. And so naturally I gravitated towards problems that allowed me to you know, put some machine learning in place at AngelList. And so one of the early problems was uh, the ability to classify news articles so that we could actually route them to the investor dashboards for any companies that they invested in. And so as you can imagine, you know, I built a simple classifier, labeled a bunch of articles and, uh, you know, had this running like pretty smoothly it Took maybe a month or two to deploy and get out the door. And so that was like step one, like, you know, pretty uh, basic run of the mill machine learning use cases. Another thing is for my own coding work. Uh, this was the early days for GitHub Copilot. Like they had just launched, I think, uh, you know, an open beta that was free to use. And, uh, you know, I was maybe one of the uh, engineers on the team trying it out and like, you know, having fun with uh, the outputs and realizing that it actually helped me write unit tests a lot faster than I could before. So it was the early days, but yeah, it was, you could see glimpses of uh, where we are today. You glossed over something there that I think is interesting. And you said, yeah, it took like a month or two to deploy when it came to the your first project. Was it, were you walking into an already mature organization? Break down what it looks like at AngelList. Yeah, uh, for machine learning, right? Um, yeah. So I was probably maybe the like the first engineer on the team to have some experience working with machine learning. And so... Yeah, it was, uh, I think, not a mature organization from that perspective at all. Like, uh, there were no data scientists, like, there were no, uh, you know, research scientists, like, no one focused on machine learning as a core uh, competency. And um, I think uh, the team had explored 
use cases, maybe off the shelf APIs that you could call for, for some use cases that under the hood used machine learning models, but nothing that had been trained specifically for AngelList use cases. So yeah, it was pretty new. What's great about this company is it's like willing to try things out and uh, really gives a lot of autonomy to all employees on the team, right? Like when we join, we're told, hey, you're the, you're the founder for your one person startup, right? And we trust you. We hire high judgment people and like you go do your thing. You don't need to, you know, ask for <laughs> too many permissions to try things out. And so I think that that clicked and that allowed me to experiment and get things out the door. Um, and so two months, I mean, in retrospect, it's maybe a bit long, but I think it's a lot shorter than what it could have been at another organization. And I had to go through, you know, a lot of approval processes and, you know, getting a uh, sign off like uh, before starting the projects. It's interesting always to hear when uh, someone comes into a company and like data science is not is non-existent. I've been there. I've been, I feel like, you know, I've been in companies where it's just kind of like it's guerrilla data science, right? You're just, you're the only person might have a, an idea of what's, how to do something. And then you're, it's up to you to also build uh, whatever you're going to build. You have to now manage sort of a platform, right? For this thing. You have to be, you're now the owner of this. So how does that, how did that look like for you going into, again, a company, not very much data science. You don't have machine learning engineers. How is that now? How is that when it got there? Like, what does that, that journey look like to actually building out something that can be useful in an AI sense. I had a bit of a head start because I was very familiar with the AWS services that supported, you know, uh, machine learning and, and text classification. I used uh, Comprehend. Uh, I trained a custom model there. And so a lot of the infrastructure was ready for me to apply to the problem. Uh, I also, you know, picked a textbook problem. So like the, like the complexity was pretty low, right? We're talking news article classification. So it was also maybe a bit of a a hack to get to a working solution faster. But uh, yeah, eventually I ended up maintaining this uh, over its life cycle and like onboarding more engineers to work in the, in, in the same framework to apply these technologies to other problems. And so uh, I think we've really built a lot of competency around this, but more from a practitioner's perspective. Like we haven't spent too much time fine tuning, you know, what, what was available. Uh, we really, you know, have leveraged off the shelf services. So I think that made the maintenance and operations of the systems a lot easier than than otherwise and do you feel like it because that's something i think those trade-offs are things that people think about a lot where it's like yeah we can just get up and running leapfrog basically go from zero to one really quick <laughs> but then you also are giving up a lot right? That's the trade-off is that you don't get to necessarily be very opinionated because everything that you're using makes those choices for you. And in your experience, it's been good enough to just go with everything off the shelf and take it and figure out how you can work within those constraints. Honestly, it was not good enough. Uh, I mean, it was good enough for a period of time, but there were like core limitations, like things that just didn't, <laughs> you know, like work for us. And, um, like two examples, like one, Comprehend, when you deploy a model, like you have to scale it to, I think the lowest priced point uh, custom model that you can deploy is like $1,000 per month. And basically they give you, you know, one server and you can't, you know, scale it up or down. Like there's no serverless solution to that. And $1,000 were pretty expensive for what we were doing. Um, and uh, so that wasn't great. And the second thing was we needed to go a little bit deeper into the news articles themselves. We needed to understand, for example, if there was an acquisition, who was the acquirer, who was the acquiree, right? And that does not come as like a default text classifier off the shelf. And so there were limitations and we actually were able to kind of deprecate the whole thing and rewrite the whole system in a day. And I'm not kidding, like in one day by leveraging uh, large language models like OpenAI. So basically a prompt, no fine tuning, just, you know, asking to classify those articles according to the categories we had defined. Maybe one or two, you know, like future arts examples, like basically like replaced and dramatically simplified like what I had, you know, spent two months building and allowed us to go even deeper to do things like, oh, now we want to know who the acquirer is, who the acquiree is. Uh, we also don't care about raises from VC funds. We only care about when a company raises. And all of that was super straightforward to write as just, you know, prompt improvements. And then that was with GPT-3, right? <laughs> and when, you know, 3.5 came along and then GPT-4 came along, like our system just got better, um, you know, with 
us and doing zero work. And it was cheaper also because now we weren't paying for that one server to keep running all the time. We were just paying per uh, per prompt, per request. And so, yeah, that's just how like the world has you know shifted a little bit <laughs> and how uh, now we are actually empowering a lot more people to basically train similar models for similar use cases, right? Without, with a way lighter infrastructure actually to do this work. So yeah, you went from cloud managed, right? AWS's solution to now you're just purely vendor, third-party option, right? Essentially, I'm sure there's AWS is still in there, but you've now just built your system around OpenAI's chat model. Pretty much, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I am assuming that you're having to do something because OpenAI doesn't know about the most up-to-date acquisitions or funding rounds, et cetera, et cetera. So are you doing some kind of uh, retrieval augmented generations or how does that look? So you basically feed the news article in the context, right? So it, it is provided with like the recent current data and like our main use case is really data extraction, uh, which means that uh, we're just asking it, hey, given this news article, like what are the key, you know, pieces of information? What are the named entities? You know, who's the acquirer? Who's the acquiry? Yeah, OpenAI works like awesome for these kinds of use cases. And we can also double check that whatever we've extracted is actually in the source, right? So like preventing hallucination is easy with a, a use case like this one. How are you doing that? I imagine you're not just like double checking human wise. We still have some human in the loop processes, um, especially for like news articles that we publish to our site, um, like doing a little bit of deduping, like picking the best article is still something that we do manually. But uh, over time, we could, you know, also you know, get rid of that once we're confident enough in, in our models. And like in practice, they've performed like amazingly well, like for those uh, uh, data retrieval tasks. I think like GPT-4 is at maybe 99% accurate, right? Like, I mean, it's... Uh, like human accuracy, right? Because humans make mistakes as well. So um, right now we, we trust it for actually most of the uh, the basic tasks in the process, right? And we start trusting it with higher and higher complexity tasks that we send it, it send its way. Dude, so if, I, if I'm understanding this correctly, it's basically like you are having a program scour the internet for the most up-to-date news and then when you get something that at some point, so how do you first classify it that it's relevant to what is happening on AngelList, just if it has a mention of a company? Pretty much. We actually, the prompt is pretty basic. It's like, uh, is this relevant to a company raising money, exiting, or, you know, having a product launch? And then from there, we ask, oh, if it's an exit, is, is it an acquisition? And if it's an acquisition, who's the acquirer and who's the acquiree? And that wow. gets us what we want. Like structured okay. as like nice like based on blobs <laughs> that we attach to our uh, data model. I imagine you have had to fight for why this is actually valuable, like a value add to the AngelList product. I'm guessing that it, at the core, it's making the investors who are on AngelList be more informed. But have you thought about how to actually quantify that? Like, do you have metrics around? Hey, you know, these open AI calls are costing us X amount, but we see that the engagement has gone up this much, which can signify more investors spending on AngelList or something like that. So this functionality was um, actually uh, something that we were paying people to do. Like we actually were working uh -huh. with contractors to do some of the manual classification before, right? So I did not have to make the business case for the need for this feature. It's actually one of the top requested feature from investors, right? Obviously you put money, a lot of money into a company, like you want to know how it's doing, you know, well, what's going on with it. Um, so we don't have a formal, I think, ROI analysis of, you know, how accurate, you know, classification of company news and uh, assignment to investments gives us in terms of engagement on the site. But we know we need this feature. And we know that we are now now able to do it way cheaper than we were able to do it before. Because, um, yeah, open AI costs are a fraction of, like, the contractor costs that, uh, you know, we were paying before. I was thinking about something. This is kind of a challenge question. You might want to cut this out later. But, uh, all right. That's so a this great is, way to start what, it. Yeah, this is what I'm going to say. So there's, there's a lot of talk around, you know, obviously there's a lot of hype around these, the, 
OpenAI's solution. We've seen a lot of models, large language models come out since and kind of present themselves right to the public. There's a lot of, I think there's some discourse around how valuable it is to build applications that literally just kind of wrap what these vendors are providing and that the real value is actually in like data, the data that's being used, right? That's where like the actual value is. So I think going off of Demetrius' question a little bit on terms of the ROI and the value add, right? You're spending X amount, obviously on on OpenAI's, you know, the API side of things, yeah, like- provide this as a service. From a long-term perspective, how do you think uh, this product could evolve to be even more valuable? Or, you know, you know, what is the next, what's the next value add if you can talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. And this is definitely, you know, these are areas that we're exploring. What I was describing with the news article classification use case was basically the first light bulb moment of, oh, wow, like this stuff we were doing manually and like, you know, with a lot of effort, we can actually d- replace it with, you know, simpler and more straightforward solutions uh, really quickly. And that led to, oh, where else can we apply this? And what else can we do with this technology? And so the point about using a lot of the data and a lot of the information that's available uh, to train custom uh, models or basically on top of the base, you know, foundation models, like train maybe focused layers that are dedicated to a subset of our data, for example, maybe the subset that's relevant to a single customer. So we can start having them, you know, interact with their information, let's say all your investments, for example, and start interrog- interrogating it just like you would have a general conversation with ChatGPT, right? Like what if you could say, uh, what investments did I make in this industry, right? In the space industry uh, that like we're at the seed level and, you know, how have now raised the series B like that, you know, is a request that reasonably could be answered by a model that's trained on all the investments that you've made. Uh, and so, yeah, these are areas that we're exploring in uh, like the part of the company that I'm working on, but it's obviously really caught on and like everyone's now thinking through how can we simplify, how can we automate and how can we improve the experiences that we're building uh, with these these new tools, right? It's become a building block, really. Okay, I, I like that answer. Good. It seems like there's kind of this race now around. There's a lot around the hype, right? Around building any kind of experience, I'll call it, around large language models. And so I think a lot of companies right now want to be part of that, right? Do you think there's value in companies taking their own data and? creating their own foundational models to build these types of solutions off of? Or do you think that it's better to just take something off the shelf as, you know, pre-trained foundation model and tune it to the needs of whatever it is your industry is, you know, whatever your problem is? Yeah. The answer from my perspective is that I think the return on investment is obvious and really straightforward with just taking off the shelf models and applying it to all those areas that, you know, require human input today, right? Like uh, yeah. from the most basic ones, like, and going up to the more and more complex ones over time, right? And so I think this is probably like our biggest investment, like maybe the 70% bet right now is like, yes, let's focus on those. We know, we clearly know what you need to do. These are the workflows that we operate, right? Uh, every day. And like, if we can reduce the costs over time for this, like we can accelerate the pace of, you know, investments going to companies uh, and increase the rate of innovation, right? That's really our primary goal. But we still want to reserve like 30% of our time to explore and see what else can be built. What are the new capabilities that can be unlocked with these technologies, right? And that's where those new experiences where we leverage the data that we already have, like on behalf of our customers, basically package it in a way that allows novel capabilities that they've never seen before. I think that's maybe the more exciting next step and obviously requires maybe a, a heavier lift, right? Like Accessing the off-the-shelf APIs, one day you get a working news article classifier. I think to train your own data, like there are a few companies out there that are, you know, helping and building the tooling to allow you to do that, right? On top of uh, maybe the, the Llama models, like the open models. So I, these are still on the prototype and, you know, hackathon stage yeah, for yeah. us, but uh, we see a lot of potential there and we definitely want to, you know, see how far we can take those. The way that you're looking at it is... Let's figure out what's the easiest that we can do because we have this new, incredibly powerful tool that we can use. And so everything that we can hit with this tool, let's go for it. And then we can graduate to the more complex scenarios and figure out how to go about that. But there's just so much surface area that we can cover with the tool that we have currently 
that we can do that. And the other piece that I really like about what you're doing is you're not saying AI is our product. It's you have a clear product already. You're just enhancing it with AI. And what I've seen as the best user experiences with these different AI capabilities that have come out, it's not reimagining a new tool that has AI at the center. It's I have my tool. Now, how can I augment my tool with AI? And it really feels like that's how you're looking at it. And I like that. What I also am pretty curious about, because you mentioned that the culture at AngelList is people told you, come in, you're like a one person startup, go and get after it. You have to really be thinking about how to create something from this mentality of, all right, if I'm going to bring a new product into fruition, what am I going to create? How is it going to look? And so it feels like you need to be very strong on the product side too. How have you thought through that? Have you evolved in your way of just being a machine learning engineer and then now thinking, okay, if I'm going to implement these new features, what do I need to think about? Yeah, it's a great question. So we work as, uh, obviously work as a team, right? So you're maybe the founder for your one person startup, uh, but like it's okay to work, you know, with a co-founder <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, you can make it a two person startup. And so we have like amazing product managers that are really, you know, helping shape those visions and flag like, and, you know, bake like the most important releases that we can uh, build for, for the company or for customers. Uh, I'd say also it's expected that as an engineer, like we come in as product engineers first and foremost, right? And you're expected to wear a lot of hats. Like you're expected to be able to, you know, go through the full stack, be able to build as like the front end as well as the back end, like for your, your feature, right? Like the entire slice of the product. And you're also expected to be, you know, able to go and talk to the uh, different maybe users, either external or internal uh, for, for what you're building and shipping. And so... Yeah, it's, uh, I think, a culture that really emphasizes that. Ultimately, like the, we like to say that the biggest promotion at AngelList is when you leave the company to start your own company, right? And so a lot of people who come in are either past founders or people who want to become founders. Uh, and so any experience they can get, you know, doing everything is, uh, you know, experience that people find valuable. Yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Aparna, founder of Arise. And the best way to stay up to date with MLOps is by subscribing to this podcast. And so then they raise a round on AngelList. They raise their seed round. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the dog food uh, product. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Thinking about that whole life cycle, you all just put out a new tool recently, right? Today, I think. And today we'll timestamp it because this probably won't go out for another month. Yeah. So it's July 20th. Tell us about what you put out and what the process was of like creating that. Yeah, so I talked about news article classification as the first use case, and we quickly found that we could apply the same technology to the investment documents that are flowing through our platform to extract things like, you know, what company is uh, uh, being invested in, like who's the investor, what's the amount that's being invested, what are all the terms, you know, is there a cap, like what's the valuation. Um, and this is technology that we first applied internally to the flow of incoming documents so we could help operations, you know, move faster so they didn't have to uh, review and read through like entire documents all the time. And we actually found that the models were super accurate, right? Like for data retrieval, again, it's easy also to double check that whatever data is retrieved is actually in the document and we could match it against the data that's entered on their platform. When an investor uh, actually submits a deal, they're able to uh, like add like the key terms that they're investing in. And our technology was there to double check from the document that, you know, what's in the document actually matches what the investor uh, expects. And so we naturally had a training set like a, or a validation set to say that our extraction actually matches, you know, what is being put into our system. And when it doesn't, actually your extraction is correct and what was put in the system was wrong. And so we could go back. It's actually a super valuable service and tell them, hey, you know, there's a difference in the document from what you are expecting, you know, your investment to be. And so 
from there, we actually decided to build a product dedicated to opening this capability to any investor, any fund manager, or any investor LP in a fund to analyze their own documents. And so that's a product called AngelList Relay uh, that we shipped and opened to the public. There's a free tier, so you can go and try it like on uh, five investment documents per month or five company updates per month. And what the tool does, essentially like with zero um, effort on your part, you just send or forward emails with the documents or the company updates that you're receiving and Relay will parse those, extract all the key terms, organize them by companies, right? And build a dashboard for you of all your investments, the terms at which you've invested. And then if you get company updates from those companies, we'll add them in the dashboard, you know, alongside the investment terms. So you can track how your companies are doing over time. And so, yeah, that's the product well, release from uh, just like uh, two days ago. Oh, so I think if I'm understanding this correctly, I invest in a seed round and the company, uh, I invest in 10 different companies in their seed round, right? And these companies all, it's too much work for me to stay on top of everything that these companies are doing, but every now and again, hopefully they raise another round or they are giving me investor updates. Again, hopefully, depending on the companies, I've, I've seen it all. But the idea here is that these companies when they give their investor updates i can just forward that update to you or i or i can upload it to relay and you will keep track of it and you will say hey well you invested at this much arr and it was this valuation now they're saying that they have this much arr and they've got these many customers and so you get to see the progress that's exactly right yeah and you can even give them your relay email address so that they send the company updates directly oh, right. to your dashboard. And we do this automatically. It doesn't matter what the format of the company update is. Like we'll, you know, parse it and structure it and extract the key information. And since we're relying on large language models, like we actually can, you know, figure things out. Like uh, if they talk about monthly burn, we can extrapolate it to like the yearly burn. Like if they talk about maybe negative values, uh, uh, it's easy to mark that as such, like on the dashboard. Um, and if they're not sending updates, like you can easily tell as well, because again, it's anchored on the investment documents that you've sent early on. And you can see, oh, this company has not sent us any updates, you know, in the last six months uh, yeah, since our funny. investment. So maybe we should double check, you know, see what's, what's up. So, yeah. What's going on over there? Okay. So break it down. What exactly are you doing on the back end? How does the tech look? Yeah. So it's pretty much like what we've built internally for own document classification and extraction use cases that we've packaged right on top of emails being sent our way. So we have a really solid document infrastructure um, that okay. allows us to you know store securely, uh, store and uh, analyze uh, this information. And we've developed prompts that we run, like basically a cascading you know, set of prompts. Like we use Langchain as the library to structure this. And nice. um, the document comes in, we classify it. Then from the classification, we determine whether it's one of the documents uh, where we support terms extraction. If we do, we apply like uh, a pretty advanced prompt, like one that you know took us a lot of uh, iterations to get right, to parse all the key terms and key information, and even maybe sometimes analyze the legal language for the document to flag anything that looks off or you know probably would require an action on the investor's part. And well, once that's all done, you know, it becomes metadata that's attached to the customer's document and that they can then retrieve in their portal. Sounds pretty, you know, straightforward because it actually is like from a technology technology perspective. And really the, the magic is in, you know, having fine-tuned those prompts with a lot of iterations to get, you know, the perfect output, like what we expect, you know, a customer, like an investor to want to see. When they did send you use them. any tools when you were looking at the prompting to like figure out what the best prompts are? I know there's a bunch out there on that layer, like the prompt layer to figure yep. out hey, how, how can we know which prompts are the best? Prompt layer, I think is actually one of those companies, right? There's yeah. a company called prompt layer. That's true. Uh, we've tried a few things. We also have like an internal um, uh, system that actually supports all of our in operations uh, that makes it really easy actually to keep a human in the loop in this process where you upload the document, you apply the prompt to it, get the data, and then you can review the output uh, then and there. And so 
yeah, I think for now it's still a bit artisanal. Or, uh, you know, it's like basically people doing some manual work. Uh, we don't have uh, fully structured regression testing capability in the sense that you could, you know, rerun a bunch of documents that we know, you know, should give this output and see if like your new new prompt leads to the same output. But this is in the works. Like these are definitely capabilities that we want for our system. It might, you know, come out as like a, maybe an expensive test suite, uh, but it's probably worth it at scale like to make sure that we keep, you know, ratcheting the quality up uh, not introducing any regression in the quality of uh, our, of our parsing. So, Thibaut, should I just become a prompt engineer? Is that what I should do for, with a, for a living now? So it's it's a good question. The the main uh, call out from from my part is actually that uh, there's still a lot of plumbing, a lot of engineering work around the prompts, right? To get, for example, the documents you know formatted in the right way, to standardize them, to extract the text from them. Like that's a lot of steps until you can actually apply the prompt to the document, and even then. Some of the documents are super long, so you need chunking, you know, like working with LangChain is not just prompt engineering. It's also like engineering of, you know, data pipelines. And so, yeah, I think there's still a lot of work to be done that's not prompt engineering. Another strategic move or um, or stance as a company is that a lot of the prompt engineering can be done by the people who know the business the best or the domain the best, right? So if the lawyers on, on the team can actually help tune and improve the prompts, right? That's uh, ideal for us because this is where we get the highest leverage. Um, and since prompts are natural language, like it's actually, uh, the barriers are are gone. Like it's possible for anyone in the company to, you know, write a prompt and, you know, keep iterating on it to get the output that they're expecting. And so uh, we're also investing heavily in, you know, putting prompt uh, engineering in the hands of operations and, uh, um, you know, the lawyers on the team for them to be able to help us move faster, right? So that engineers can focus on once the prompts are in a good space, deploying them in production and running them at scale. So I want to I want to kind of hit on this a bit because it's an interesting thing. Cause it's something I've believed in for a lot of years. So, like, I think uh, obviously a human in the loop is important for this process, mm -hmm. right? It's, yep. it's, it's important for your guys' whole development life cycle. Do you, and you, you're, you're trying to work towards an automated regression test system to be able to, okay, you know, can I, can I deploy without, with less human intervention, but do you foresee no human intervention? And I preface this with like going back like five or so years when auto ML was the big thing, right? When everybody was all the rage about, Hey, I can just throw some data at this thing and it'll get the, yeah. the ball for you, do all the hyperparameter tuning for you and everything. Right. So do you foresee that eventually we're not going to need a human in the loop in this process potentially like the process of drafting the prompts and yes like them? is prompt engineering going to be an automated thing pretty much yeah i mean if uh if you read asimov like uh you know <laughs> eventually that's maybe where humanity gets at some points and so yeah i think there's definitely uh, a long-term vision where this is true and this you know happens i think there is still quite a few Definitely months, maybe years of uh, really exciting work for, for people, you know, for us to do before we get there. Uh, and we also need to, you know, still distill what actually is needed, you know, what the customers want, what terms like are relevant and important to parse from these documents. You know, what's, uh, how do you see if there's a pay to play clause in an investment document, right? These are uh, concepts that um, obviously I think at some point, you know, could be inferred uh, automatically. But for now, we're still doing the goal setting. You know, I haven't seen models that actually tell you this is what you should do, you know, in a way that is directly usable. And so still a few years of exciting <laughs> work in this space for, for us humans. So I wonder about when it comes back to the architecture of what you've built and having full confidence in the output what are you doing to make sure that there's not hallucinations that sneak through? Yeah, so for us, in the problem set that we've tackled and actually deployed in production, it is possible to just double check that the extracted text is actually present in the document, right? So we always have like ground truth uh, that we can go back to. We were talking about how data is important in a given space, and I think it's still relevant and true for like using large language models or foundational models because as I said, like early on, we actually have a ton of 
documents that have flowed through our platform for past investments and that are matched to the structured data in our database, right? Where we uh, are the system of record. And, you know, that data has been double, triple checked by, right. you know, mm -hmm. the user, by our team, like the operations team. And so that made for a very convenient, like, uh, test set, right? So we can write the prompt and check that what it extracts actually matches what's in our system and do that at scale, like with a lot of examples. And that's helped us build great prompts and also the confidence that the model is actually performing, you know, uh, amazingly well. I think uh, we're uh, at the, our current stage, we're claiming, you know, 99% accuracy in Relay. This has been verified, like with all of the back testing that we've done on, uh, on previous documents. So I think both use cases that you've talked about, you are in a great position because if things do go off the rails, you're not going to like kill anyone like in autonomous driving. I think in the relay one, it's probably more important that you do have that cross check with your database because it's money at play, right? And so maybe mm -hmm. people yep. can be getting an update that says they need to pay money and really they don't need to or whatever that may be. So it's good to have that there. But again, when I think about like the risk on this use case it is it's a little bit lower down when you think about something like oh well is it the healthcare use case or is it an autonomous driving use case and those are a lot more scary when you're just leaving it all up to a computer to figure out and so i like that you've been able to figure out how can we incorporate this into our product as much as possible and I imagine it's not all flowers and tie-dye with the hippies, peace, and love. What have the challenges been, right? Like there's got to have been some snags that you ran into. Yeah. Um, it's actually funny. It's really more around scaling or calls to open AI. Like honestly, like the, the biggest <laughs> struggle for me has been spending time trying to figure out how to get, you know, access to GPT-4, to GPT-432K, how to get higher rate limits so that we can handle the volume, right, of documents that we want to parse. Um, and it's funny because um, yeah, it's like a lot of it is, you know, trying to find the right point of contact at OpenAI and getting, you know, a response uh, on a question like that. And uh, we, yeah, we found, you know, eventually found partners that, uh, you know, could help us with this. We also found that we could leverage uh, Azure directly, um, you know, uh -huh. that deploys exactly the same endpoints. Uh, and it's actually a lot more flexible from a, you know, scaling perspective. And it is maybe a little bit closer to what we were familiar with, right? Like a cloud environment where you provision resources and you can increase, you know, rate limits with a, a simple request and you can track your usage <laughs> in a way that's, uh, you know, maybe a little more uh, stable and structured. And so um, we now like, you know, have calls going to both Azure and OpenAI directly. And like, we're able to like increase our rate limits by having that routing happening between the two. Uh, and we're also exploring, you know, deploying our own like train models on, on top of these tasks. So I think costs are way lower than if we had people doing this work. So we're already, you know, saving money by doing this. And we expect, you know, the cost of intelligence to keep going down over time. And so like we, we bet heavily that we wanted to first go with breadth, try to apply this to as many use cases as possible, not thinking too hard about optimization just yet. But we obviously need to get there, the ability to maybe train our own model, deploy it on dedicated hardware, you know, so we can scale according to our needs, I think is um, an interesting next step for us, something that, you know, we're looking forward to. So is that like your upper limit then? Is that your scaling upper limit is the third party vendor? You're, you know, Correct. Open yeah. and measure. That's your, okay. So that's what you're, that, yeah, I was going to ask that. It's a, from a challenge perspective, do you think then there's, that's why there needs to be investment in other models besides, you know, what OpenAI is providing you? Do you, do you find that there's going to be value and maybe we should diversify our model portfolio in terms of what we're using and use different models to even open that up and, or I don't know, kind of be uh, flexible that way? Yeah, makes perfect sense. And um, I believe so, like uh, pretty strongly. I think, uh, again, ownership of the, the models themselves, you know, would grant us more flexibility, right? We were talking about the 30% use case, this investment in maybe longer term capabilities where we're training uh, bespoke models for each customer on the platform. Uh, from a technical perspective, it is doable. 
not super cheap, but it's not super expensive either. Uh, but it's only possible like if we own the keys to the, you know, the model layers, right? So if we own the base model, maybe have a layer that's specific to AngelList as a whole, like the investment, you know, uh, ecosystem. And then on top of that, maybe a s really small sliver that's con constantly retrained for your own specific customer data. We, in order to build something like this, we need control over how the models are trained, right? So uh, there's sure. some appetite to actually, you know, build up a competency in the space, right? And have on-premise, like, you know, trained, like internally trained models that we can work with. But as far as models that are more or less the same idea of open AI, you haven't thought about going with like a Cohere or Anthropic or anything like that? Like for us, having to integrate with another model would just, you know, increase the complexity of our system, yeah. right? And we figured that it was maybe not required to pay that cost just yet because we're not hitting any roadblocks with OpenAI. It does what we need, right? So we're not in a space where we're going to save pennies by trying maybe a different provider uh, just yet. And uh, maybe another thing is there's a tiny bit of a relationship with op OpenAI, right? Like, uh, I guess uh, Sam Altman spoke at the... <laughs> last AngelList Confidential Conference. And so, uh, um, you know, and I, I'll i say like from personal experience, uh, OpenAI has been like the top quality model, mm. right? So we decided to just go use it for now, learn as much as we could, you know, in this space with the best in class capability, right? And then there's a moment in time when we're going to switch to cost optimization. And then I think it might be reasonable for us to explore other approaches. Yeah, I, I do like that idea. It's like, Let's not get distracted with anything except for how can we bring AI into our product and how can we make sure that it's valuable. And all of the other stuff, we can figure that out once we've proven out this first assumption, which is, does this actually make a difference? That's exactly right. Yep. Well, I admire the focus on that because I am the opposite sometimes, so... Do you feel like there are ethical concerns that we should be thinking about when it comes to using AI and money? You talked about like the comparison with uh, maybe the you know healthcare space or maybe self-driving, right? I think the key here is that ultimately at the end of the day, like the legal documents are the source of truth, right? So if there's ever a question with, you know, what the uh, allocation in a deal should be or how much a certain person owns in that deal, you can always refer back to the the documents, right? The legal documents. And so uh, I think from here, like in our space, as you said, like this is an industry that's like a perfect fit for these models because we're talking about text. It's all text, right? Uh, a lot of legal text. <laughs> uh, so it's also pretty structured, right? It's not completely free form. Um, and yeah, the outcome, like the, the worst case scenario is you know, just something where something looks off and you go double check the document and like you use that as, uh, you know, the guiding truth. And so it saves a ton right. of time, like, you know, from people, humans reading through a lot of like uh, text that's, you know, really repetitive. Uh, and as I said, humans also make mistakes. And we found that actually the models are more accurate and make fewer mistakes than, uh, you know, when you have people, even like experts reading through those documents, right? Sometimes you just go maybe too fast or you skip a paragraph that had the information that you needed, uh, the model won't do that, right? It will look at everything in the document and consistently output the same, you know, uh, results from that analysis. Yes. So here's another one that I totally forgot that I wanted to ask you. And But when it comes to prompts, have you noticed that when OpenAI releases a model update, it breaks some of your prompts or you have to go and yep. rework them? This happened to us. Um, so it was temporary though. Like I, I need to clarify that this was uh, like the move to the June model. Basically, yet yeah, there was maybe a eight hour period where uh, things were broken. <laughs> so technically like our API calls were either failing or maybe using the wrong model um, and that got fixed. And now like, you know, we're back to where things were before. We also found that maybe some prompts are actually working better than they used to. Uh, I know there's a lot of noise out there about, you know, how there's a regression in the quality of uh, the output from uh, from GPT-4, especially for things around code. We're not parsing code, like we're doing legal document reading and entity extraction. And for those use cases, like this is, has been a continuous, you know, march towards better accuracy with simpler prompts. Um, yeah, the part about 
maybe operational excellence, like still being a work in progress, um, is something that like does ring true to me. Like the models, like or open AI APIs can go down, right? And so we've built some uh, resilient systems that can retry until they're back up. Um, it's less true now than it was three months ago, but yeah, I'll just say that having worked now with Azure OpenAI and like the OpenAI APIs directly, like Azure is actually more robust and has been like more consistent in uh, in its responses. Uh, but the underlying models are the same. And so right now we're low ba load balancing between the two, but we actually are glad that we have a fallback if the main models, you know, start uh, <laughs> breaking or like not responding anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe another incentive to go and build in-house, right? So that like we're not dependent on uh, uh, third parties' availability. That said, again, that comes, that comes doing fast priorities. Oh, so, yeah. That comes with its own challenges. When you start building your own stuff, right? Then, then you're exactly. all exactly. Then we might also hit you know operational excellence issues. So <laughs> yeah. exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, dude, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you coming on here and giving us a little peek behind what's happening at AngelList and how you all are using this and how you've been up, been able to get up and running so quickly. It's fascinating to hear the story. And I think we'll end it there. Sounds good. Yeah, we appreciate uh, the opportunity. Hey, I'm Vishnu. I'm a data scientist at First Hand, and I definitely think that you should subscribe to the MLOps Coffee Sessions podcast. It's the best podcast out there to stay on top of what MLOps actually is, to talk to the true thought leaders in the space. And oh, by the way, Demetrios is absolutely hilarious. What a weird guy. You should definitely subscribe to the podcast.